So again, welcome back. We're back here in school as we are each week. And I understand, uh, looking at some of the gray hair in this room, it's been a few days between classrooms, and that's good. I applaud you as lifetime learners. Welcome to many students that are in our other classes. Good to see you guys up here in the education zone. Students, you need to promote yourselves as front rows at all times. This is an education partner, a partnership between the museum and the college that's been going on. We're working on our third year now and really proud of all of the opportunities that have been presented to the community and even more proud of the community members and students that have taken advantage of these opportunities. So week one, just a brief little recap, what we did learn in week one, that there was a road to this civil war and nothing was imminent. For 10 years, our country was involved in a very decisive type of political behavior. And we covered things like the Missouri Compromise, the infamous popular sovereignty, letting the states decide, the Dred Scott decision, and finally, Southern secession. So we want you to take away the idea that when a country goes to war, this is a monumental decision that does not have one reason, but a series of many, many reasons that played out in some respects over 87 years, but certainly in the decade prior to the Civil War. We haven't talked much about slavery, and this is an essential part of this war. The Emancipation Proclamation would be issued in January of 1863, so slightly near the halfway point, and that would change the focus of the war. So slavery has always been an essential element, and we purposely have left this out of our presentation because we have 11 hours of your attention on the bus to go to Gettysburg. <laughs> Last week, George talked to us, gave us that road from the first shots at Fort Sumter right up to the eve of Gettysburg. So our story, and remember, history is a series of his stories and her stories. Our story has now led us right up to the very eve of Gettysburg and the most pivotal battle in really our country's history. On the eve of Gettysburg, we learned last week that Stonewall Jackson would die, and he would die at Chancellorsville. And the loss of Stonewall Jackson would certainly change the Confederacy. Much of your reading students, you've learned about what changes took place and how orders were relayed from Longstreet to Lee to Stewart, and part of this was having to reorganize this military without the infamous Stonewall Jackson. But make no mistake about it, Robert E. Lee is leading an invincible army. They've got every reason to feel extremely confident. They've been on a tremendous winning streak. Robert E. Lee is really at the peak of his game, and this army is ready and poised to strike north and potentially end the war. So this invincible army is making its way north, crossing into Pennsylvania with a plan to end this war. And this plan is going to be shared with us through the infamous battle at Gettysburg. We have got tonight two fabulous historians, teachers, and licensed Getty Gettysburg guides who are going to help us walk through this important battle. Richard Corr and Christina Moon are employed by a guide service of which it is the absolute elite of guides. To be a Gettysburg guide, you must be licensed. There's an incredible training process, an incredible screening process. They are all entertainers as well as informative guides. And tonight, we're looking forward to them sharing the story. You have in front of you a map with four different smaller maps on there. They're going to walk you through that map series of which you see up in the upper left-hand corner, the movement north, and that's the Gettysburg campaign, which is a approximately 30-day campaign. And then there's, there are three different days of Gettysburg, July the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, and the guides will, will work on that. So tonight we are very pleased, very uh, honored to welcome via Skype presentation Richard Corr and Christina Moon. Please join me in welcoming them. I 
that means we're up. <laughs> Hello? Um, so I'm not sure where you guys kind of stopped being able to hear me, I guess. The really quick version to recap on the morning of July 1st is that men of Buford's cavalry start a fight on a piece of high ground two and a half miles west of Gettysburg. They fall back slowly as Union infantry arrives on the battlefield. The initial Union infantry attack on the morning of July 1st is a success for the Union men. The Union men drive back the Confederates. And on the afternoon of July 1st, the two armies will basically engage in a race to see who can get to the best piece of high ground on the battlefield first. And the best piece of high ground on the first day's battlefield at Gettysburg is a hill called Oak Hill. And it's eventually the Confederates who will gain Oak Hill first. They get there with more men. And from their position on Oak Hill, the Confederates will end up launching a series of attacks against the Union Army, and they will succeed in hitting the Union Army on their flank. And that's one thing that I'm assuming you've talked about in class, but just in case you haven't, the way these men fight during the Civil War is in this, what we call a line of battle. So imagine that you had 300 soldiers. 150 would stand in a front row, shoulder to shoulder, and behind them, 150 in a back row, shoulder to shoulder. You have 300, I have 300. You are 300, attack mine. If you attack me on the front of my line, it's 300 versus 300, one to one. But if you attack me on the side of my line, it's 300 versus just two, one at the end of each line. So you can hit the first two men in line, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth. You can roll your enemy's line up like a fist. So the end of the line, the flank, is always the weakest, most vulnerable point. So the Confederates will hit the Union flank on the afternoon of July 1st. And after several hours of very intense fighting that I think is often overlooked by modern historians, the Confederates will succeed in driving the Union men back from the fields west of town. They'll push them all the way back through the town of Gettysburg and eventually back to a hill called Cemetery Hill. And I'll be honest with you, some of my favorite maps of the Battle of Gettysburg actually come off of Wikipedia. I think that's shameful for a professional to say, but <laughs> this is the wonderful Wikipedia map of the first day's battlefield. So again, the fighting starts west of town, Union men drive the Confederates back, and then it moves north in town where the Confederates will hit the Union men on the flank and force the Union men all the way back to Cemetery Hill. And that's where the Union men will end the second day on top, or in the first day, I'm sorry, on top of Cemetery Hill. And one of the interesting things about the Battle of Gettysburg is I think most of us give the Confederate Army credit for the win on July 1st. Well, the Confederates take fewer casualties on July 1st. The total casualty count on the first day is about 16,000, 9,000 Union men, 7,000 Confederates. And even though the Confederates drive the men back off the higher ground west of town, it's not particularly valuable ground. The Confederates end the day on top of, or the Union men, I'm sorry, end the day on top of Cemetery Hill, which is a far superior position. And the Confederates will spend the next two days of the battle trying to push the men off the high ground of Cemetery Hill. So even though we give the Confederates the win, I think that's something that maybe we should reconsider. Ready? Oh, well, okay. Okay. Um, just to kind of elaborate on what Christina said, um, I, I, the analogy I always use when I describe the first day to folks is is it's you want the your opponent to go 90 yards for a touchdown instead of 10. And the Union Army knows the high ground south of town is there simply because that's where they've come from. They, they've approached the battlefield from that direction. The Confederates don't know the high, high ground exists literally until the end of the day. And uh, so the Union Army is really trading time for ground. I mean, that, that's the best way to, to mm -hmm. describe uh, the first day of the Battle of Gettysburg from a Union perspective. So, so, so you've got a very different scenario on day two and again on day three, just because the terrain has changed so dramatically. And, and this is where we, we describe um, the Union battle line looking like a fish hook. Uh, when, when you look at just about any book on Gettysburg, you look at maps of the battlefield, you're always going to hear this reference. I think what it basically comes down to is this. If you're George Meade, and, and I can't emphasize this enough, he missed the whole first day. This guy was uh, 15 miles away from Gettysburg when the battle began. He did not reach the field until that evening. 
um, he's talking to the people who were on the field, and, and he wants to know what went wrong. You know, why did the South win the first day of this battle? Everyone has the same answer. Uh, they got around our flanks, and there was nothing we could do to prevent it. A way to protect your flank, just as Christina said, put it on high ground. Get the end of your line up on a hill. If you can do that, now it's going to be much more difficult for your opponent to attack you. If you're George Meade on July the 2nd, you're looking to get each end of your line on high ground. So, so the Union fish hook basically starts just south of town on a hill called Culp's Hill. That's the point of the hook. It will wrap around Cemetery Hill. It kind of curves around three sides of Cemetery Hill. And then it begins to extend south along a low ridge, which is called Cemetery Ridge. Two miles south of Cemetery Hill, down here, are two more hills. Little Round Top and Big Round Top. In this case, the Big Hill is actually not going to be all that important, uh, simply because it was densely wooded, virtually no visibility from Big Round Top. It's the highest hill in the entire battlefield, but you can't see anything if you're there. Little Round Top, as, as those of you who come to Gettysburg in a couple weeks will see, is very open. And when you stand on the hill, you have a spectacular view of the entire area. If you're George Meade, Little Round Top is going to be the natural left flank of your battle line. That hook is four miles long from end to end. Robert E. Lee knows on July the 2nd, he has to get the Union Army off the hill. He's going to try to do the same thing he did on the first day. He's going to try to come around and attack the flank. He's not going to attack the northern end of the line. He's not going to attack Cemetery Hill or Culp's Hill. Um, Cemetery Hill really was the strongest point on the Union line on the morning of the 2nd as Lee surveyed the terrain from his vantage point. Uh, the Union Army had a lot of artillery on Cemetery Hill. It's a, it's a fantastic artillery platform. You had about 75 cannon up there by the morning of July the 2nd. I mean, I mean, the bottom line is if you're Robert E. Lee and you're looking for a weak spot, the hill with the 75 cannons is not it. You know, you're not going to go charging up that hill. So his strategy was to extend his line south along a ridge called Seminary Ridge, basically parallels the straight portion of the hook, get past the end of the Union line, and then sweep out and hit the flank. He's going to give this job to his most experienced commander, his second in command since the death of Jackson several months earlier, James Longstreet. The problem, there's James, that's, that's it. That's Longstreet. You may recognize him from the movie Gettysburg. Tom Berenger played him in the movie with the worst beard in the history of Hollywood. For those of you who have seen the uh, movie Gettysburg. Uh, but Longstreet basically has, has, has is given his orders at 10 in the morning. But he is told, get into position without being seen. The only route he can find to accomplish that is through a valley about a mile west of, of the Confederate line. He's going to end up marching about five miles with 15,000 troops, 50 pieces of artillery. Each cannon is towed by a team of six horses. Um, moving artillery cross-country, and part of this is cross-country, is very time-consuming. The bottom line is the attack does not begin until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So it takes virtually all day for the Confederate troops to, to get into position to launch the assault. When Longstreet's men come up out of the valley and, and, and form for their attack, they're going to discover Union troops directly in front of them. Uh, this is a surprise to the Confederates. It is an equally great surprise to George Meade, the Union commander. Uh, these troops are badly out of position. These troops are commanded by this gentleman, whose picture we're going to show you now. His name is Dan Sickles. Now, if you're not familiar with Dan Sickles, he is almost the stereotypical 19th century politician. Uh, he came out of Tammany Hall in New York City. Uh, he is what is referred to during the Civil War period as a war Democrat, which is a member of the Democratic Party that supports Lincoln in the war effort. Sickles is a major general here at Gettysburg. He's got 10,000 troops under his command. Uh, the problem is he's the only high-ranking general in the Union Army who is not a West Point graduate, and, and he basically has no military experience. He's only been in the Army a year and a half, but, but he's been appointed as a general simply because of his political connections. And Sickles disobeys his orders. He just moves way out in front of where he should have been, creates a big gap in the line, and leaves Little Round Top unprotected. When you look at the map that Christina's pointing to you, that big kind of broad V or L out there, that's Sickles uh, after he made the decision to move forward. 
Confederates are going to take advantage of this. You know, there, there's a gap in the line. You're going to go through it. If there's nobody on the hill, you're going to try to take the hill. And this is essentially what the Confederates are trying to accomplish uh, once they get into position and finally launch their assault at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Meade is not aware of what Sickles has done. Uh, Meade had given Sickles orders to extend the line to the round top. Sickles failed to do that. You know, if you give somebody an order, you expect them to do it. And it's as simple as that. Uh, Meade's going to find out at the last moment what Sickles has done. Uh, it's too late to pull Sickles back. He, he literally is closer to the Confederate line than he is to his original position. The only option Meade has is to rush reinforcements into position behind Sickles to try to rebuild the line by shifting troops from one end of the battlefield to the other. Joshua Chamberlain is featured so prominently in The Killer Angels, featured so prominently in the movie Gettysburg. Uh, Joshua Chamberlain's regiment, the 20th Maine, is one of the regiments that is rushed to the south end of the field to try to deal with the fact that Sickles is out of position. And the Union Army survives Sickles' blunder by the narrowest of margins. Uh, the first Union troops get to Little Round Top 10 minutes before the Confederates arrive. This easily could have gone the other way. During the course of the afternoon, Sickles gets clobbered. He, he starts today with about 10,000 people. He's going to lose nearly half of them in three hours of fighting. Uh, but the Union Army is able to secure the hill and reestablish the line from Little Round Top back to Cemetery Ridge, where they're going to link up with everybody else. In other words, they're able to rebuild the fish hook. But it took a lot of fighting. Confederates gained a lot of ground. For the second day in a row, we have significant casualties. Here, the, the, the casualties occur in a relatively brief window of time, about three hours. Um, so, so in 180 minutes of fighting, the Union Army is going to lose 10,000 men. Sickles loses 5,000. The troops sent to his aid lose 5,000. Confederate losses are about 18,000 people. Uh, it basically comes down to 100 casualties per minute of fighting. So if you clap your hands, that's, that's two casualties. You know, and just keep doing that for three hours. That gives you the idea of the intensity of the fighting during the course of the second day. The Union Army was very fortunate that they survived this mistake. This, this easily could have changed the outcome of the battle. Sickles himself will be struck in the right leg by a cannonball during the latter stages of the fight. Gets hit in the leg by a 12-pound cannonball. Uh, this shatters his leg. The inevitable happens. The leg is going to be amputated. Uh, Meade uses this as an excuse to quietly remove Dan Sickles from command. Uh, Meade understood that court-martialing Sickles would have been very, very messy. He's politically well-connected. He's friends with Lincoln. Uh, when the Confederates blow his leg off, they've solved the problem for you, essentially. So, uh, so, so Meade is going to use that as an excuse to get rid of Sickles. Unfortunately for Meade, and, and this is one of the reasons why we don't hear a lot about Meade, Sickles lives forever. Uh, he's wounded in July of 1863. He dies in May of 1914. This guy lives to be 95 years of age. And one of the things that we frequently hear when we talk about historic events, uh, especially battles, we hear the phrase, the, uh, the, the winners write the history. And I got ahead of myself there because it's not the winners that write the history. It's the survivors that write the history. And Dan Sickles is definitely a survivor. He's going to rewrite the history of the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, Meade died in 1872. Sickles will claim that Meade was going to retreat on July the 2nd. According to Sickles, by bravely moving forward against his orders, he lured the Confederates into attacking him, forced the Union Army to remain at Gettysburg. The Union Army wins the battle. So therefore, the true hero of Gettysburg is Dan Sickles. Uh, it's a great story. There's no truth to it. Sickles told it often enough and well enough that people eventually believed it. He got reelected to Congress after the war. Uh, in 1897, he's awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for his role in Gettysburg. If you've ever been to Arlington National Cemetery and you've seen the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, Dan Sickles is buried about 200 yards from the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. So he's buried in a very prominent spot in Arlington National Cemetery. He had the amputated leg preserved. Which, yeah, you, that, that will tell you everything you need to know about Dan Sickles psychologically. Uh, and, and it's actually in D.C. It's, it's in the National Museum of Health and Medicine. If you time it right, in one afternoon, you can visit all of Dan Sickles. You know, the two parts are roughly five miles apart. Okay, So uh, if you Google Dan Sickles' way, you'll get a picture and you'll see what happens when you get in the way of a cannonball that's going 200 miles per hour. But, uh, but the bottom line is the Union Army still held the ground at the end of the day 
They held at the beginning of the day. The Confederates captured a lot of ground on day two. Confederates think they're winning at the end of day two. Robert E. Lee says as much in his battle report. Well, this is because of all the ground that they took. They didn't know Sickles was out of position. And a lot of this begins to set the stage for that third and final day, what's commonly referred to as Pickett's Charge. She's going to tell you about that. All right. So I'm going to bring out another map here really quick. If I can sit down. There we go. So this is the fish hook line as it is actually supposed to be. And this is essentially the third day map. And if we just go back to what Rich said, on the second day of the battle, the sort of really brief overview is that Robert E. Lee attacks both flanks. So he does make an attack against Culp's Hill, and he makes an attack against Little Round Top. And long story short, despite what Dan Sickles does, both flanks hold for the Union Army. So the Union Army is strongest on their flanks, and if they're strongest on the flanks, they have to be weak somewhere. And process of elimination would tell you that week somewhere is pretty much right here at the center. So Lee's battle plan for July 3rd became an all-out Confederate attack aimed right for the Union center. Basically, the idea was that it would break the Union line in half. He could crush the Union army, capture Cemetery Hill, and drive the Union army from the battlefield. Not a very lofty goal, is it? So to execute his plan of attack, Lee puts in place about depending on the numbers, you look at 12,000, 12,500 men. And the bulk of that attacking force is part of Pickett's Division of Virginians. And the reason he chooses Pickett's men for this attack is that they're fresh to the battlefield. They are the only troops in the Confederate Army up to this point that have seen no combat. Sickles' men arrive on the battle... I'm sorry, not Sickles, yeah, Pickett. Yeah, we, Pickett. Have, we do that a lot. Oh, we get we'll them get confused. That. Correct. <laughs> so... Actually, on one tour, I actually referred to Pickles' charge, and that was just a complete <laughs> disaster. But So Pickett's men do not arrive on the battlefield until about 4 o'clock on the afternoon of July 2nd. So they're a little bit too late to be involved in any of the fighting. They're kept in a reserve position on the second day. So they are fresh troops to make the attack. And the other half of the attacking column will be made up of two other divisions, one commanded by James Johnson Pettigrew and the other commanded by a general named Isaac Trimble. These units saw a lot of action on the first day and were pretty badly shot up and neither Pettigrew nor Trimble are their original commanders. They are new to command on the third day of the battle. So altogether you have a line of Confederates that stretches nearly a mile wide. Waiting for them on Cemetery Ridge are four to 6,000 Union soldiers. In front of the Confederates, about 150 cannons. Behind the Union men, about 100 cannons. And again, depending on your source, those numbers can vary pretty greatly. But at about 1 o'clock on the afternoon of July 3rd, the Confederate cannons opened fire on the Union center. And the objective for the Confederate cannons is pretty simple. They want to drive the Union men from the battlefield. They want to demoralize the Union infantry. And they want to make it easier for their own infantry to make the attack. And they didn't expect it to take very long. Goal time is 30, maybe 45 minutes. But one of the problems the Confederates are going to run into fairly quickly are actually two problems. The first problem, I would say, is the weather. On July 3rd, 1863, it's 87 degrees at Gettysburg. And while I hope you don't experience this when you come here in late October, it is typically very humid here, and it is worse so in July. And that humidity combined with the lack of wind on the third day meant that the smoke firing between these perhaps 250 cannons became so dense that at one point, one Union artillery commander said you couldn't see beyond the length of your arm. The other problem the Confederates had is a lack of accurate fuses. And a lot of their fuses would burn too long. And pretty quickly between the lack of visibility and the poor fuses, the Confederates started to overshoot the Union battle line. And any hope they really had of softening up the Union position before the infantry attack could be made all but disappeared. And there's a lot of debate about how long the artillery bombardment lasts. It may have been 45 minutes. It may have gone on for two hours. But the long story short of it is the Confederates eventually run out of ammunition. The Union men had stopped firing in anticipation of the Confederate attack. So at about 3 o'clock on the afternoon of July 3rd, 12,000 Confederate soldiers stepped off from the position known as Seminary Ridge to charge across seven-eighths of a mile of open field 
against the Union position on Cemetery Ridge. The Confederates, as they move across the field, start taking heavy casualties because while the Confederate artillery had run out of ammunition, the Union artillery had not. And they were able to continue firing at the Confederates as they made their way across the field. Eventually, the Confederates would be slowed down along a road called the Emmitsburg Road. And on either side of the Emmitsburg Road were heavy wooden fences. And these wooden fences started to block the attack of the Confederates. And this, guys, is a view from the Emmitsburg Road, which would be down here at the bottom of the picture, up towards Cemetery Ridge. And it's just an open field. There's absolutely nothing there. So the Confederates are marching across this open field directly into the mouths of the Union guns as they make their way across. And by the time they get to the Emmitsburg Road, the Confederates have taken very heavy casualties. There's probably only one brigade commander left standing of the nine who started the attack. And you'll probably remember that man from the Killer Angels. His name is Louis Addison Armistead. And Armistead famously puts his hat on the tip of his sword, looks at his men and said, who will follow me, boys? Let's give them the cold steel. And Armistead and his men charged into the Union battle line. At the Union position was a low stone wall. And as Armistead and his men reached the stone wall, only about 150 were able to walk over or jump over the stone wall. And as they did, they quickly became surrounded by the Union men. The fighting became hand to hand. Armistead ordered his men to turn the Union cannons on the Union soldiers, but he was shot and fell mortally wounded. And that's where you have the famous story of Armistead who was a Freemason calling out the super secret Masonic distress signal. And he was attended to by a brother Freemason. Now, if you saw the movie Gettysburg and Gettysburg for convenience, they made that Tom Chamberlain. It's not, it's actually one of General Hancock's aides, Henry Bingham. And Henry Bingham approaches General Armistead and said, sir, is there anything I can do for you? And Armistead said, he'd like to speak to the general in command of the men on the ridge. It was Winfield Scott Hancock. And that is true about Armistead and Hancock being friends. They've been stationed together in California prior to the Civil War. Unfortunately, Hancock had been very badly wounded a little bit earlier in the attack. So Bingham does not allow Armistead to see his friend. Armistead was eventually taken back to a Union Field Hospital where he died just a few days later of his wounds. Hancock survived his wounds and ran for president about 20 years later. He lost the election to James Garfield. But at the center of the Union battle line, Hancock's men had surrounded Armistead's. With the loss of General Armistead, the Confederates were leaderless. They are outnumbered. They're fighting hand to hand. From the time the Confederates stepped off Seminary Ridge to the time that they are surrounded in Cemetery Ridge, it's probably only about 45 minutes. And in that short span of 45 minutes, I think any hope the Confederates had for winning a victory on northern soil just disappeared. Of the men who made it past the stone wall, every single one is killed, wounded, or captured. Of the men who made it past the Emmitsburg Road, very few escaped without injury. And eventually everybody started to retreat towards Seminary Ridge, and Lee came riding out to meet his men. He started out with 12,000, 12,500. By the time the attack is done, he's lost more than 50% of his men. And he says, and what I think is one of the more amazing moments of the American Civil War, it's all my fault. It has all been my fault. He rallies his men on Seminary Ridge that evening, expecting a counterattack from George Meade, which never comes. And the next day, July 4th, Independence Day, it starts to rain at Gettysburg. And the rain is torrential downpours. And the two armies spend most of the day digging graves on the battlefield, setting up hospitals. But that night, Lee will start to use the cover of the rain to move his men out of Gettysburg and eventually south towards Virginia. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the Battle of Gettysburg in about uh, 55 minutes. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for coming. Next week, the same time, we'll be welcoming Ted and Faye Chamberlain. Ted Chamberlain, a descendant of Joshua Chamberlain. And we'll look at some historical theater.